Petra was a cat. A Pleistocene cat. Probably at least 11,000 years old, living near the end of the most recent ice age. Petra, now a mere skeleton, got stranded in a cave and remained frozen in time by the cave's stable environment, and hadn't seen the light in millennia, until 2016 when a group of curious cavers discovered it. The cave, now named Buria Cave, was discovered in 2016 by Mike and Katerina Fico, who immediately began exploration and survey. On their third trip, they entered the cave with Mike and Andrea Futrell, Sarah Fleetwood, Philip Schuhart, Joe Muir, and Tommy Kleckner. The cave survey brought them to the room where Petra laid in its final rest. Realizing the importance of the discovery, the team looked around for a paleontologist with the needed skills and motivation, and they found me, Dr. Alex Hastings. At the time, I was the assistant curator of paleontology at the Virginia Museum of Natural History, and right away, I could tell this was an absolutely exceptional find, and that it would have to be removed in order to really study in detail. But what is involved in recovering a large set of bones from the depths of Boria Cave? How do you get to the cave? What is the passage like to get to the bones? Are the bones fully articulated? Are they mush, or are they solid? How should they be packed? and how to get them out. That is what this program is about. The science, the steps, the process, what is required to recover the bones of an ancient cat with the least damage. A lot of pre-planning must take place before the actual removal process can be started. Permission to access and enter the cave must be obtained. Permits were required. A schedule must be determined and supplies purchased and staged. But most importantly, a strong team of experienced cavers was needed. In order to match this team of experienced cavers, I had to do a year of strenuous cave and vertical training before I was ready to enter the cave and meet Petra. After training was completed and the details finalized, it was decided that the excavation would start on September 30th, 2021. Even though I had since moved to the Science Museum of Minnesota, here, it was decided that the bones would stay in Virginia and go to the Virginia Museum of Natural History in Martinsville. The project was a team effort and included the support of the U.S. Forest Service, particularly the Clinch Ranger District, the Cave Conservancy of the Virginias, the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, Division of Natural Heritage, the Virginia Museum of Natural History, the Science Museum of Minnesota, and most importantly, the help of cavers who volunteered their free time to help extract the skeleton. Aside from all the pre-planning that must take place, the first step in the process, of course, is getting to the cave. Buria Cave is located on George Washington and Jefferson National Forest in cliffs of the mountains of Lee County, Virginia. There are no trails leading to it. To get to the entrance, it's necessary to descend a steep mountainside for about a mile. Ropes were set up for safety at a steep section just before the entrance. The entrance to Buria Cave is comfortable enough, but within the first 30 feet, you must negotiate a 40-foot deep pit. A competent team of cavers carried approximately 18 packs into the cave. Okay. The team consisted of Andrea and Mike Futrell, Zena and Will Orndorff, Tom Malabad, Lauren Satterfield, Joe Mir, Katarina Kozic Fico, Mike Fico, Dave Saki, and me. The route to the bones is dark, muddy, and constrictive, with narrow, low passages and crevices that have deep holes in the floor, requiring traverse lines for safety. The floorless traverse ends at the top of a second 40 foot pit. One of the biggest challenges is getting all the gear and material for the excavation to the dig site. When rappelling down the pits, the packs are tethered to the caver's seat harness. After several hours of struggling with gear through the cave, the room where the bones are located is finally reached. I immediately fell in love with how amazingly well-preserved Petra was. This is unbelievable. All right. The bones just nice and clean and fresh. Like, there we it's go. too much light. Yeah. No. It's, it's kind of like good. it died yesterday, which is exactly right? what you yeah. want. After the excitement of first inspection was over, it was time to start the process of detailed examination. First is photos and measurements. 
Joe Muir takes multiple photographs from many different angles to produce a 3D reconstruction of the skeleton. In addition, I take copious notes and make detailed drawings of the bones before they are disturbed. One of the big questions that needed to be answered was how fragile the bones are. Are they hard and solid, or are they fragile and crumbly? This is important to know since the answer would determine how the bones are recovered and what steps need to occur to preserve their initial state. Since the cavers didn't want to touch the bones until I saw them, I had to plan several alternatives on how to transport the bones out of the cave. I planned for fragile, crumbly bones and packed all the material necessary to make plaster cases around the bones. As you will soon see, nothing ever goes quite as planned. That's, that's not going to work. Initial probing indicated that the skeleton was solid, but there were small, loose pieces which could be separated, including some of the teeth. Yep, it's the, the root of the canine. Okay. Into the bone. Right, right there. Right okay. there, where it's broken off. In some cases, it was hard to tell if a piece was a bone or a rock. If they were deemed informative, the pieces were carefully wrapped, labeled, and stored in a box. Soon enough, the question came down to how well the skeleton was attached to the floor of the cave. It took meticulous probing, scraping, and inspection by the team to determine this. It soon became apparent that it would take some major digging around and under the bones to detach them from the floor. The bones were large enough that a supervised group effort made sense. Luckily, the cavers were eager to learn and careful enough to be able to help. Zena, Joe, Katerina, Lauren, and I dug for an entire day before the skeleton was fully excavated. After much scraping and digging, it became obvious that the whole skeleton was encrusted together as one piece thanks to the process of calcification. The skeleton was too big and heavy to transport through the tight, muddy cave passages in one piece. Because of this, it was necessary to find natural breakpoints so the skeleton could be separated into more manageable pieces. All right, so you're gonna break right there. You're gonna take all that. It was heartbreaking to have to break the skeleton, but it had to be done. Attempts were made to find the best place to break the skeleton, but sometimes the bones would break in unexpected locations. One of the breakpoints was for the cat's leg. The bone was obviously hollow, and looking inside, one could see the crystallization that had taken place over the ages. Eventually, the skeleton was separated into smaller pieces. The legs, front and back. Further end of the femur, okay. right here, yeah. going into tibia and fibula of both legs. And then the, um, what makes up the beginning of the toe bones right there. And hopefully the little tiny bones in the end of the feet are in okay. here too. Cool. The spine. The chest, the very important skull, oh my God, look at and even the tail. After the heartache of breaking this beauty, we decided to call it a day and left the cave. We resurfaced at 1 a.m., stashed our vertical gear, and headed up the hill. You remember the plan of plastering the skeleton and packing up the pieces in boxes? Well, it was now obvious that this plan wouldn't work. And as so often in caving and paleontology, improvisation was needed. But what would be strong enough to protect the fragile bones and small enough to fit into the cave packs? Our answer was foam sleeping pads from a big box store. Mike Fico and Tom Malabad made a store run for supplies, including foam sleeping pads, wooden paint stirrers, and lots more duct tape and traveled all the way back to the dig site. The bones may have been solid, but they were still very fragile. In order to keep them from being damaged while moving them out of the cave, it was necessary to package them so they could handle the banging and bashing while being transported. The first step was to wrap the pieces in toilet paper. Yes, the cavers learned that the paleontologists too rely on the most basic supplies such as toilet paper. Wads were first wetted with spray bottles so that they could be molded in places around the bones, filling bends and crevices. The padding was necessary to get rid of bends and jagged edges, which could break the bone if bumped or banged. Lots of toilet paper was used. After packing with toilet paper, the bones were then wrapped in bubble wrap. Several layers were wound around with tape used to make sure the wrapping stayed put. And then, for even more protection, Green foam padding was added over the bubble wrap. 
skeleton, some of the bones would be transported out of the cave inside soft cave packs. A final layer of foam padding was added. This is where the sleeping pads and wood paint stir splints came into play. Once the bone was fully wrapped and protected, the final package barely fit into the cave pack. The bone was now prepared to endure the banging and jostling during its journey out of the cave. Still, we had to be careful not to drop it down one of the 40-foot pits. One of the more important pieces was the skull, which was in extraordinarily good shape. Here I point out some of the more important aspects of the cat skull. Alright, so we got the skull uh, with the nose pointing over here. We got the back of the head with the big strong sagittal crest. This is the right eye. The cheekbone broke a bit right there. And uh, we already pulled off the right canine uh, was right there. And uh, we actually have the right lower jaw is right here. And we can actually even see that um, there's some nice teeth in there too. Yeah. All right, so we've got these little bones that were buried at the bottom. Okay. And yeah. then we've got, um, should be part of the skull coming through the mud here. Right, right, okay. Um, so this is, this hasn't been turned over until just now. Yeah. So this is our yeah. first chance seeing the other side. Wow. That's fun! <laughs> After wrapping and packing the skull, the group determines that it will fit into one of the plastic boxes brought in for that purpose. This part of the plan worked after all. Oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Room to spare so here. The final chore of the second day was to transport all of the packaged bones and all other material out of the cave. As can be seen, it is a formidable pile of muddy packs and containers. And the packs weigh a ton because of all that wet, gloppy mud. Mike and Andrea Futrell and Zena and Will Orndorff rigged haul systems with progress capture at each of the vertical drops. These made it easier to get the heavy packs up the ropes while minimizing the potential for damage to the bones. For most of the horizontal passage, we found it easiest to use a human chain to move the packages down the passages, essentially passing each package one at a time from person to person. Finally, the last of the bones and the last person exited the cave around 3 a.m. Sunday morning. After food and sleep, the group recovered the rest of the packages later Sunday morning and staged them at the Natural Tunnel State Park cabin where we were lodging. The recovery of the cat bones, of Petra, was a group effort that took days to accomplish. Before everyone went their separate ways, a group photo was taken. From left to right, top to bottom, is Zena Orndorf, Dave Saki, Tom Malabad, Mike Futrell, Joe Muir, Andrea Futrell, Dr. Alex Hastings, that's me, Will Orndorf, Katarina Kosicvico, Lauren Satterfield, and Mike Fico. The next phase will be at the Virginia Museum of Natural History in Martinsville, where much more work will take place, including formal identification. Petra's journey continues. Stay tuned.